personal uh, story about Bob Cohen for me is that he's the reason I came back to MIT. I was an undergraduate here from 80 to 84, and actually I took two polymer science classes, one from Ed Merrill and one from Bob Cohen, polymer chemistry and polymer physics, physical chemistry. Got excited about it, went away, worked a couple years, uh, went back to grad school at Georgia Tech, uh, where I was getting a master's degree. And I read in the alumni newsletter that there was this new program being started by Bob Cohen. And it was going to be a polymer program that would allow you to really dig in and learn the polymer fundamentals. And I was in the middle of my degree then, but I thought, instead of finishing up here, I want to go back <laughs> and plunge into this new program and, and get the PhD. So uh, it was actually his introduction of the program. And earlier we heard Rosanna Lim uh, explain that PhD CEP brought her here and was the dream <coughs> degree for her. It was the dream degree for me. And uh, so I want to thank you particularly for starting that here at Brown. I'm going to be talking about layer by layer assembly and approaches that we're using to incorporate drugs into these layer by layer thin films. And since you've already had a bit of an introduction and reference and a number of you have worked in this area, I won't spend a lot of time talking about mechanism, uh, but what we've been doing in our lab is using this beautiful approach, which allows you to incorporate any sort of multivalent charge system into these thin films as a way to create a design drug release system. And the idea is to replace what might be a more traditional depot for drugs, for example, um, a polylactic acid or polycaprolactone, which uh, through the rules we learned from Flory can only allow you to create a homogeneous mixture up to very low weight concentrations of drug and replace that uh, system, which may give us release of all components at once, with a system that will allow you to incorporate more drug. And in this case, using layer by layer, we can build the drug as one of the film components. And by being able to make the charged species, the drug, uh, we can actually incorporate much higher loadings of drug into an extremely compact form. Uh, this means we can get not just one or two weight percent, but something closer to 10, 30, 40, 50 weight percent of drug into these thin films. And we can also design these systems so that the uh, biologic drug or system that we're interested in building is layered with different degradable polymer systems. And as long as these are compatible degradable polymer chains, uh, we can incorporate them in a way that allows us to get a very nice and controlled release. We can get uh, not only unique release profiles for unique drugs, but if we introduce barriers in between these thin film uh, composites, we can actually generate staggered release profiles as well. And this ends up being very interesting, and we've been applying this to a range of different applications. One of them is illustrated in this picture here. You recognize this is uh, a whole joint, orthopedic joint, and uh, uh, clearly from what you've heard from Bob, from Arun, um, that this is actually an area that has grown uh, from uh, Bob's lab and Merrill's lab. We're interested in being able to incorporate thin films onto orthopedic uh, devices in a way that would allow us to release small molecule drugs in combination with much larger growth factors. What's also nice about this is that we don't have to worry about applying heat or solvent to any of our drugs. And because we are interested in biologic drugs, proteins, siRNA, DNA, uh, we can directly absorb them from water into these layer by layer thin films at uh, the pH range that keeps them active and stable. So this is the general idea of layer by layer assembly and you can see that it could be useful to release something like an antibiotic uh, in a uh, cavity in which you've in introduced a biomedical device and then to introduce growth factors which can, for example, regenerate tissue. So I'll just give you a couple of examples in which we use this approach. Uh, one of them is large bone defects. These are defects that are so large that uh, they cannot heal. Uh, and, uh, you know, I sure, uh, at one point you may have heard someone say, you know, they, they've got a hole in the head. Well, sometimes this actually happens. We can have traumatic injuries that lead to large pieces, pieces of skull or um, jaw missing. And for these kinds of repair operations, uh, there are very few choices. Uh, one of the common treatments right now is to take a graft from the hip, uh, grind it up, and then apply it, uh, tr sometimes on top of a template, a, a permanent or rigid template. Uh, however, this is not very uh, effective in all cases. It's very difficult in pediatric cases where there's going to be a change in skull size. 
It's very difficult to take this graft in many cases. Not all patients have healthy bone that can be donated to another part of the body, and the graft site is problematic. It often can get infected. It can cause problems. So we're very interested in, uh, in addressing this problem without having to extract something from the patient, but rather to induce bone generation from the native stem cells that reside in our body. So in our approach, we've taken a very standard degradable polymer, polylactic co-glycolic acid. Uh, we can use phase inversion. Some of you remember learning this approach, where you just uh, take the solution of PLGA and uh, Dr. Blade, some of you know what that means, <laughs> across, create a film and immerse it in water, and you will get these porous films to lift off. These are sort of uh, lightweight, uh, flexible, slightly even rubbery materials uh, after we have processed them in this way. And we can then coat the top surface of those membranes with a layer by layer film. In our case, we were very interested in being able to take advantage of the fact that we can create a somewhat more staged or slightly staggered release profile by stacking drugs on top of each other. Uh, and uh, the reason this is interesting is because the things that we're trying to release in this case are growth factors. Uh, a growth factor that can induce bone is called BMP2, and uh, it actually recruits uh, the native stem cells from bone marrow to generate bone around the implant. But we're also introduced, in interested in allowing a healthy vascular system to be generated in that bone. And we can release growth factors which support uh, the generation of vascularization. Uh, in case one of them is uh, PDGF, platelet-derived growth factor, and that one will help to support vascular uh, networks. So we're going to release uh, a system in which BMP2 is on the bottom and PDGF is on the top. This is what the release profile looks like in vitro. You can see that there's a somewhat more rapid release of the top drug simply because of surface erosion, but there is some under diffusion. This is uh, essentially due to intermixing of the uh, layers. And when we look at these systems, we see that we can heal uh, large defects. Here we have the control. Here we have the membrane coated with 0.2 micrograms of the BMP2 in this layer by layer form, and this is a rat cranial defect. Uh, and with just 0.2 micrograms, we're able to see significant healing. It's worth saying something about the dose here because uh, typically uh, BMP2 is delivered in the form of a collagen sponge that releases in a bolus form. And you have to use something like three to five milligrams of BMP2. That's three to five thousand dollars worth of protein. Here we're looking at orders of magnitude lower doses in this localized release and we're releasing over long time periods. Here you can see the membrane with two micrograms and there's absolutely no difference in terms of the amount of closure of that defect. And when we look at 0.2 micrograms of BMP2 and 0.2 micrograms of PDGF, there's very little difference. We may see a little bit faster healing, but we have to explore the histology to really understand if there's anything meaningful going on. So we actually look at histological slices of this tissue. And here you can see the defect where nothing has happened. If you just put the membrane down alone, you'll have fibroblasts crawl across that membrane and deposit collagen, and you'll get this sort of collagenous or scab-like matrix, but it's not real bone. Um, if you use BMP2, you do indeed recruit osteoprogenitors to the site from uh, the adult native uh, bone marrow. And, and what you see is deposition of calcium, uh, which forms a bone matrix, and it's actually quite a, a large matrix. However, the mechanical properties of this bone does not match the mechanical properties of the native bone. Uh, it's more brittle. We also see that if we add more BMP2, we get just a big lump of bone, so you get a bit of a cap. And here you can see that if you introduce BMP2 but precede it with the PDGF, we end up with this very nicely vascularized bone matrix. It turns out that it's very difficult to tell the difference between the newly generated bone and the native bone. We also see that rather than getting these rough surfaces and defects, uh, we see a nice smooth arrangement of the bone. And we believe this is in due part uh, due to the fact that we've generated a vascular system that allows the second wave of cells to arrive, which are osteoclasts. And those are the cells which remodel bone. They break down the original bone with enzymes and they allow that bone to be rebuilt in a much more stratified and oriented fashion. So here we can get a much nicer uh, version of bone and uh, we're excited about using this approach to generate much more complex growth factor release systems. Um, we've also done uh, much more straightforward uh, approaches to uh, generating coatings on biomedical implants. 
In the orthopedic implant work that we've been doing, uh, we've been looking at ways in which we can uh, essentially coat an implant. In this case, we chose peak uh, plastic, but we've also coated titanium with a layer-by-layer -layer film. And uh, the idea is to release an antibiotic first, gentamicin, and then BMP2. Gentamicin is a small, positively charged molecule which layers into the top layers of the film, and BMP2 is a large, positively charged uh, macromolecule. We designed these systems so that gentamicin comes out very rapidly in the beginning, uh, over the first 24 hours, and then there's a small trail of it that remains uh, released over a, uh, an extended time period to prevent reinfection. And the idea is to destroy a biofilm that is already present in a joint. Uh, and BMP2 is then released over a period of out to uh, 60 days. Now, in this study, we actually generated uh, an infected tibia model. So there's a biofilm existent in the tibia, and uh, then, you know, we drill a hole, create that biofilm, and then introduce the implant. If we introduce the implant without any treatment, we see resorption of bone or bone loss. You can see that here in this image of the untreated system. And also you see lack of bone growth. Bone is, is false colored green here. However, if you introduce gentamicin alone, you eliminate the biofilm sufficiently enough uh, to allow some bone growth to occur, though not complete. And ultimately, uh, if you introduce BMP2, you get a much more rapid regeneration of bone and tissue, and this can actually result in much faster patient recovery. So we're looking at ways in which we can adapt that approach. Now, I'll give you a very quick uh, second example of the application of uh, this approach. We talked about hard tissue, uh, but we're also interested in the healing of soft tissue. Uh, many of you are familiar with uh, chronic wound healing, and there are also issues with uh, fibrotic wound healing. Both of these kinds of processes are due to the dysregulation of a genetic process, usually the overexpression of a protein. Diabetic ulcers are the result of the overexpression of a protein known as MMP9, in part. There are a series of proteins which break down collagen, and they're supposed to appear in the remodeling phase of wound healing, but in diabetic uh, patients, they often appear early in the wound healing stage and prevent the deposition of the tissue that you need to close a wound. So you get these uh, diabetic ulcers. What we've been doing is using layer by layer as an approach to incorporate siRNA directly into a layer by layer complex. And uh, here we're using a very simple polyelectrolyte, chitazan, which is derived from crab shells and is a nice positive charge and a saccharide backbone. And uh, we can get a very high loading of the siRNA. This siRNA is going to silence the MMP9 gene and prevent uh, the generation of that protein. Uh, underneath that, we have a degradable underlayer that's going to essentially flake off the film over time. So what we're doing is taking a nylon dressing, layer by layering it with this combination. The siRNA in this case is uh, fluorescently labeled, so you can see it. And we varied release profiles to get an optimum release over a two-week period. Um, if we actually apply these uh, bandages on a diabetic mouse, uh, we can look at uh, a treated and untreated uh, wound as a control. We also looked at a scrambled siRNA as a control. And what we found was that we get significant knockdown of the MMP9 gene, uh, up to 65% in one week and up to 85% in two weeks, which is something that gets us very excited because this is sufficient enough knockdown to see a very real result in the MMP9 activity. What this means is that if we look at the treated versus the untreated sample, top and bottom here at seven days, we already see a bridge of blue collagen uh, in these wounds at early stages compared to the untreated diabetic ulcer. At 14 days, we see a huge plug of tissue is being generated in the uh, treated ulcer as opposed to the wound in which we have no treatment. And uh, here you can see a close-up of those differences. What all of this means is that we get a much more rapid closure of the wound. And here we see our treatment in black compared to the untreated in white. And in both the uh, epithelial closure, which is the skin, and the underlying muscle closure, we get more rapid uh, results. So now we're applying the same kind of idea to a different problem. We've been involved in the Institute for Soldier Nanotechnologies, uh, and we're very interested in being able to address fibrotic scarring. Uh, a large number of soldiers will get large traumatic injury to soft tissue, which will result in fibrotic scarring, in particular if there's burn associated with that wound. And that ends up 
uh, not only limiting mobility, this is an example of a, a huge amount of scarring that can take place that can cause contraction of muscle and uh, can limit the function uh, of, of the patient, but it also improves lifestyle if we can address scarring. So right now, uh, we're looking at ways in which we can do this. This is one example of an early series of tests on a third degree burn model in which we can show knockdown across a wound that allows the generation of blood vessels in our tissue compared to the scar tissue, which has very few blood vessels, and a much rougher and more functional skin surface, something that looks more like functional skin with uh, the beginnings of hair follicles and sweat glands as opposed to the smoothness that you get with regular scar tissue. So this is our, our current venture and frontier area for us. And we're now looking at uh, a range of genetic targets. The one that I described is one called connective tissue growth factor, but it's just one of a series of proteins that are important in the wound healing process. All right, so I described some of the work that we've been doing in this area, uh, in particular in this uh, sort of soft and hard tissue wound healing. Um, we've also had a lot of fun working with another PPST student, Daryl Irvin, uh, who is a professor in biological engineering. And uh, his lab, we've been designing layer by layer systems which release either plasmid DNA or a protein that is antigenic. Uh, the plasmid DNA encodes for the antigen, uh, we can, or we can directly incorporate the antigen in very thin films on a lift off surface. And uh, when we do that, we can uh, use these micro needles, which are shown here, with a lift off layer uh, so that we apply it to the skin wait a couple of minutes and you can remove it and leave behind the layer by layer film. So imagine having your own personalized multi-layer tattoo. That is the idea here. The tattoo then releases over several days uh, the vaccine. And finally, we're using the same layer by layer approach to coat nanoparticles which have a chemotherapy drug in the core and uh, siRNA in the exterior to address cancer in the Koch Institute, which is uh, where our new lab home is. So I'd like to stop here and just thank Bob one more time for his inspiration. He has had an incredible impact on my own career, um, and I know how much of an impact he's had on all of yours. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, address him and, and to be able to appreciate everything that he's done. Thank you, Bob. So while Robbie's getting his talk up, I, uh, I learned this morning that he saved two pieces of real estate after my time, apparently, <laughs> <laughs> became productive in the Cohen lab. But few of you know that uh, there's a history of chemical engineers going to Harvard, the George Whiteside's lab. And uh, uh, the first one to go, I think, was Nick Abbott. <coughs> and then Paul went, and George thought he'd struck a gold mine. And then I went. <laughs> One more try, and I think that was Robbie. <laughs> and that might have been it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Paul. So, uh, I think I mentioned to some people my father was actually a PhD chemical engineer from MIT, so he left in 71 just before Bob got here. So, I like to say, I've had a father figure at MIT for the last 50 years. It's been kind of fun. <laughs> so when I first got here, it was a different time. Right? So if you look back to the 90s, Tim Duncan was playing basketball. Right? <laughs> MIT was the top-ranked department in the country. Mike Rubner looked like he was 40 years old. Right? <laughs> the, the, Cl the Clintons were running for the White House. So. <laughs> So not a whole lot has changed. <laughs> but it's still great to be back. So I actually thought this was supposed to be a roast, but I missed the mark. <laughs> so, so I had to tone things down a little bit. So that's actually student of Bob. I don't know what you're thinking. Right? <laughs> All right. So I had a few anecdotes sort of uh, dealing with my experiences, interactions with Bob over the years. And I think they will just give you a flavor into the kind of person he is. So I'll just quickly walk through these. And then if there's time, I might tell you one uh, scientific story. All right. So moving back to 93, I was a prospective graduate student. 
And I think this happened at the Bates Motel, uh, University of Minnesota, where I met <laughs> Cora Dancy, who was from the MIT class of 93. And so as prospective students, you're all nervous about this big decision. And so she was coming from MIT, so I was trying to pump her for information. And so when Bob's name came up, her eyes just lit up. And she said, oh, everyone loves him. And so that was that. So shortly thereafter, you know, all you need is love. So <laughs> shortly thereafter, I came to MIT, joined his group. Um, and in another couple of years, we were writing our first paper. Now, I'll mention in passing, and this might be, we can get into details at dinner. Bob was at Caltech at the same time as Feynman, and I don't think he quite approved of all aspects of Feynman, so we, but we can get back to that later. But anyway, <laughs> so this is my first scientific paper. I've never written one before, don't exactly know what I'm doing. So in my introduction, I had this beautiful quote from Richard Feynman, and we were mentioning George. And so if there was some other advice, this was, of course, completely inappropriate. And so if there was any other advisor, you know, George, he may have <laughs> questioned your parentage or, you know, written back, <laughs> written back saying, it's clear you have no clue what you're doing. But I still remember how kind Bob was. So he said, I know, I know. Everyone likes to quote Feynman, but I think we should take this part off. And so, you know, it was a very gentle, gentle. All right. And another thing which people have touched on is, you know, you go into Bob's office and, you know, you have the whole weight of the world on your shoulders, things are moving slowly, you're depressed, and he had this uncanny ability to find, you know, latch on to some small success and just make you feel so much better. I don't think I've ever left his office without feeling much, much better about myself and the work. It was, it's a gift, actually, very, very special. All right, so midway through my thesis, Bob and Jane actually went to India. So Jane was actually born in Madras. And during this trip, they actually took a road trip to the Taj Mahal. And when Bob came back from this trip, his hair had gone completely white. <laughs> and, and you know, this, this was when they had camcorders, and so Bob actually invited me to his house for dinner, saying, I have to show you these videos. And so they're actually about, I'd actually never been to the Taj at that point, but. They're about this road trip, and it's essentially three hours of truck drivers playing chicken with you. So divided less highways, they drive on all sides of the road, and Bob, look at him, look at that guy, I still remember. <laughs> now, Bob has this passion for science, but he's also a huge sports fan. And so, you know, this topic would come up in his office a lot. And the one time I remember was actually Cal Ripken, so uh, as you might know. Around my time in the group, Cal Ripken was about to beat Lou Gehrig's record for you know, most consecutive games. And so I was actually happened to be in Bob's office the day after he broke the record. And Bob was describing he had watched the game on TV. And you know he's getting all excited. And he's saying, and so I turn the TV on. And he comes up to bat. And the whole crowd is cheering. And he hits a home run. And I'm tearing up. And I still remember the passion <laughs> in Bob's voice. It's so beautiful. All right. Casablanca, uh, so you know, MIT has the IAP period, and this is when Bob took on belly, no, no, no belly dancing. But, so actually, Mike Rubner had alluded to this. So the, my last paper at MIT was actually the first layer-by-layer -layer paper, I think, between Bob and Mike. And as I say in Casablanca, this was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. So it's really great to see how that work has taken on a life of its own. And so, you know, I always enjoyed interacting with Mike. All right, so a little bit of science, and then I have one other anecdote at the end. And so <clears throat> one of the things my group is working on recently, so we still stick with nanomaterials, and I got that from Bob. And we are trying to apply nanomaterials to address medical problems. And so one of our targets is the influenza virus. And so these are taken from the literature. On the right, you have an electron micrograph. And speaking of microscopy, over lunch, we were all reminiscing about Mike Frangillo and the hazing that we, <laughs> the hazing we all went through uh, during our PhD. <laughs> but, but anyway, so this is the nice looking TEM. And in the envelope, this purple protein is called hemagglutinin. So this is the receptor binding protein. And the immune response to the flu virus also targets that protein. And so when you take a seasonal flu shot, most of the antibodies that are generated target what's called the head of hemagglutinin. But this is problematic because the head is also a highly variable reason, region. 
And this is why we need to take a flu shot every year. It turns out that the virus has a so-called Achilles heel, and it is in the heel or stock of this hemagglutinin and protein. However, in response to a seasonal flu shot, you don't typically elicit antibodies binding here, but such antibodies have been isolated and they're broadly neutralizing. And so the question has been, could you design a vaccine that could actually elicit antibodies binding to this region, and this could form the basis of what's called a universal vaccine? All right. And so when posed with such difficult problems, the first thing you ask is, what would Bob do? <laughs> and so <laughs> I talked to Paula, and she was able to dig through the archives and come up with this old photograph. <laughs> and so this is actually from the story of Achilles, where they're holding on to the heel. But I don't know about any other resemblances. So the idea we had was, so you really want antibodies that bind down here. Right? But in the context of the viral envelope, this region is not very accessible. So what if, instead of displaying the hemagglutin in, in the normal orientation, you flipped it around? Right? This might make the stock much more accessible and elicit antibodies binding there. And so that's what we proceeded to do, initially using carbon nanotubes as a scaffold. I'll walk through this very quickly. And so you start with a carbon nanotube, attach a polymer peg, biotinylate it, then decorate it with streptavidin. You can characterize the streptavidin by labeling with gold. And you can actually think of this as layer by layer, if you like, right? A layer of PEG, layer of streptavidin. You can then attach the antigen, which is biotinylated biochemically, either at the tail or the head. And this allows you to generate scaffolds presenting the antigen in these two different orientations. We then collaborated with a group at the Mount Sinai Medical Center who immunized mice with these two different antigens, right? Two different doses. And they challenged the immunized animals with a virus presenting a chimeric version of hemagglutinin. So this chimeric hemagglutinin has a stock similar to that used for immunization, but a completely different head. And so protection would depend on antibodies that recognize the stock. Right? And so this is what we see. At the bottom are the two controls. So this is surviving mice versus time. So with the nanotubes alone, or the nanotubes in the normal orientation, no protection. But in this inverse protection, four out of five animals survived. And we have done this with other scaffolds as well, such as virus-like particles. But in the interest of time, I'll just skip this part. All right. So the last anecdote I want to tell you is, so you know, I, I always go to Bob for advice and suggestions. And this is just after my postdoc. I was about to head to RPI, and I'd come to see Bob. And he mentioned that he had a close friend in biomedical engineering. And he said, you know, she's really trustworthy. You should go meet her. She'd help you out. And then to illustrate how trustworthy she was, she said, she's someone you could leave a pot of gold with at night and still come back in the morning and find it to be there. Right? And so this was actually excellent advice. And Rena was a great help to me when I started. But I remember thinking at the time that who could this, uh, these words apply to more than Bob, right? You know, who, who else would you leave your pot of gold with? And even that doesn't quite do it, right? I think Bob is the pot of gold. So he's the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and we found him when he came to graduate school. So, you know, it's our luck to have interacted with you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for organizing this wonderful event, and it's, it's just great. Thank you. I don't know exactly when the Register Cohen Group summer meeting started. Maybe right at the end of my time. Uh, I remember going on at least two of them. Uh, but the thing I remember the most is that when you go to Princeton, you stay in the Red Roof Inn. Budgets have improved. Red Roof Inn. <laughs> well, thanks, Paul. And, and so, as, uh, as many of you know, I, I did not have the good fortune of being uh, one of Bob's students, like most of the folks on the program this afternoon. Uh, I, but I was 
an undergraduate here at MIT, actually same class as Paula, and so I uh, got to meet Bob very early in my career, uh, and um, you know, but since, since I wasn't one of his students, that means I wasn't born into the Cohen academic family, I was adopted. Uh, and, you know, so I'm, I'm very, I want to thank Bob publicly for adopting me, uh, again, very early in my career, for including me in your academic family for the last 30 years uh, and for today's symposium. So, and I do have one photo. Uh, so you can, some, you saw this in the slideshow. So these are pictures both from 1984. So, you know, here's, here's Bob, you know, looking more or less the same. And here's me, not unfortunately looking more or less the same. Uh, you know, so you can tell which of us is aged better, but uh, you know, those are genuine photos. And if you want to see some more, uh, Paul already mentioned the great uh, micro symposium that we've had, uh, the fir programs for the first 22 of those, along with several photos are all up on the symposium website, so you can peruse those at your leisure. And, and that's also been a very nice thing, because through that, I've gotten to know uh, several generations, if you will, of Cohen students, more than, you know, more than I would have from five years in the lab. I've gotten to see 25 years of people in the audience, and so it's really been wonderful. Uh, and so today I'll, I'll give you a, a short version of a talk on a project that we've undertaken recently. Most of this is the work of Dong Yoon Kim and it's been in collaboration with uh, Promeris. And the uh, goal here is to make polymers that are suitable as separation membranes that will selectively remove butanol from dilute aqueous solution, you can think fermentation broth if you're thinking dilute aqueous solution. And so norbornines, uh, some of you may know, so you can polymerize norbornines, and here I'm just showing unsubstituted parent compound in multiple ways. You can do ROMP, ring opening metathesis polymerization, which I learned about from Bob and which we still do a lot of in my lab, but that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, you can also not open any of the rings. You can polymerize these through the double bonds and make this vinyl addition type polymer. And as you can probably guess just by looking at the structure, uh, you know, if you have this bicyclic ring in the backbone every monomer unit, these polymers have very high glass transition temperatures. And that turns out to be relevant for the application here. The unsubstituted parent compound has a TG of 385. Okay. And, of course, you don't have to stick with the parent compound. You can hang various substituents off of these carbons away from the locus of polymerization to change whatever physical properties you're after. In this case, it would be perm selectivity. And in particular, I'm going to show you uh, some data on polymers like this, where one of the uh, units has this uh, hexafluoroisopropanol substituent, or HFA, hexafluoroalcohol. Uh, that actually confers uh, selective selectivity for butanol, as I'll be talking about. And uh, another block here, for example, this homopolymer of N-butyl, so the TG is a little bit lower, but still these are really huge numbers, I mean, for the TG of, of a, you know, what is ultimately a flexible coil polymer despite the local rigidity of the chain. Mm -hmm. And I won't talk about uh, this so much, but working with the folks from Primaris, we did come up with living polymerization chemistries for these, so you can make narrow molecular weight distribution, you can make well-defined block copolymers, uh, take my word for it. Um, okay, so what's the goal here? As I said, we're trying to uh, recover butanol from dilute aqueous solutions. Butanol is already an important chemical building block. I mean, think butyl methacrylate in all of your latex paints, right? Where do you get the, you know, how do you make that you from butanol and methacrylic acid? Uh, and certainly people are talking about perhaps uh, making this be a next generation biofuel. Uh, it is a natural product of a number of species, particularly clostrid clostridium species, uh, but it is uh, like ethanol, toxic to the organisms which produce it, but it's much more toxic than ethanol. So the maximum titer you can get is only uh, you know, 13 grams per liter or 1.3 weight percent, so you've got a very dilute solution. Uh, and this means that your reactor has pretty low productivity because once you get the 1.3%, you've got to stop. And if you're going to separate and recover it by distillation, it's very energy intensive. So what you would like is to continuously remove that product uh, as it's produced. Then you could run your fermenter more or less continuously. It greatly improves the productivity of the system. 
And if you can get a really nicely selective membrane that will transport butanol very preferentially over water, this could also be very energy efficient. Um, today, the current state of the art for this kind of a separation, taking organics out of water, is PDMS. Uh, and we bought a good commercial PDMS membrane, which is used in this application. And if you, and so I'll show you this data to start for comparison. This is kind of the benchmark. Uh, at 60 degrees with 1% butanol in the feed, we can get 20% butanol in the permeate. This is a process separation factor beta of 25. This is sort of the weight fraction of butanol over water in the permeate divided by weight fraction of butanol over water in the feed. Okay, with a mass flux of 1,700 in these units, grams per meter squared per hour. So, okay, so just remember these numbers, 25 and 1,700, okay? Uh, and um, PDMS, as you know, is a soft elastomer. So it sort of works, uh, but one of the problems with PDMS, and one of the reasons why we thought these norbornines would be better, is that you know, PDMS is very soft material, low modulus, low tensile strength. So to put it into this application, the, the perm selective layer has to be relatively thick just for mechanical integrity. Relatively thick means low flux. Okay, so we thought, well, these norbornines, high TG, even though they'll be somewhat plasticized in operation, TG will still be above room temperature. So now we can make very thin layers. Maybe we can get much higher flux, so maybe we can beat this number. We still have to uh, compete with or beat that number. Okay. And we thought, well, we'll do this with block copolymers. You know, the idea is that we'll have one block that uh, We'll, do the, we'll be responsible for the transport, and it turns out that that HFANB that I showed you already, that homopolymer is soluble in, in butanol, in neat butanol, not 1% butanol, but it'll dissolve in butanol. So, and the butyl norbornene block does not, and we thought you know, that'll allow us to control swelling and enhance mechanical integrity. And this, we, we knew this was a good idea um, because, after all, We'd learned from Bob uh, in the late 80s when he worked on gas transport that you can divide up the functions uh, of a membrane in this way. You have one block that's responsible for the transport and the other blocks in there to modulate mechanical properties and give you the other pro things that you want. Okay. Turns out that's not, uh, we thought it was a good idea. It is a good idea for gas separations. It turns out that that's not exactly how these work. Uh, I'll show you, but we still got to a pretty good end uh, in this. So we made a whole series of block copolymers of those two units that I showed you. Um, and uh, they're all about 100,000 grams per mole with different weight fractions of the HFA and B. Uh, just, just because we, we have to do small angle x-ray scattering, so just to show you we can make all, you know, despite the peculiar nature of the repeat unit, these make all the morphologies you're used to seeing. If it's roughly symmetric, you get lamellae, you can get hexagonally packed cylinders, and you can get, you know, not very well-ordered spheres over here. Um, that's reciprocal space. Uh, we can cast these into supported membranes, so you just cast it from solution on top of a porous support here. So this is, a, uh, this is the block copolymer layer here. This one's a little bit less than two microns thick, so very thin, but very uniform in a simple hand casting process here. And you can see the same morphologies now in real space, so this is a cross-sectional view. Uh, if you take the top view, you can see again spheres. Cylinders lying in plane and basically nothing which we think is lamellae lying in plane. Okay, so you can get all these uh, different morphologies All right, what about performance? Okay, so here's here's some data for uh, Flux shown in black and separation factors shown in red as a function of block copolymer composition So let's start over here. This is that HFA homopolymer Okay, uh, and so as you increase the amount of butyl, which we were viewing as the non-transporting unit, the flux goes down. Okay, no surprise there. That's, that was expected. What's surprising are the red dots. Okay, this is the separation factor for the HFA homopolymer. And if all the transport is going through that block, you would think that you know, this would essentially be flat. That is, you're not going to improve the situation by adding in the butyl units, but you do. Okay, so you go from here, which is maybe about 14 in these units, up to 21.4, I think, is this number. So, you know, not quite as good as PDMS, but getting close. Okay, so that was 
uh, odd. Okay, that, that is that adding these butyl units would really improve the performance of these. So I told Dong Yun, postdoc, well, go back and make the equivalent random copolymers, because these block copolymers will be way better than those random copolymers. It'll be a nice figure for the paper. Um, and he did that, and it, it's, it's not really quite how I thought it was going to turn out. Again, as you increase the butyl content, the flux goes down. Um, you can see the same sort of a maximum in the random copolymers, RCPs, that you do in the block copolymers. And the black copolymers are somewhat better. You know, the best you can do here is maybe 18 versus 21. But you know, in broad brush, they're kind of similar. Okay? And what that's telling us is that our initial picture about the transport only going through this one phase is wrong. Actually, both of the units are involved. Certainly, uh, there's no way to avoid that in the random copolymer case. And the, the true function of this butyl norbornene is to control the swelling of the membrane, which we've measured separately. And apparently, it also changes the selectivity of that swelling. That is, that as you put these butyl units in, uh, although the total swelling goes down, you're disfavoring swelling by water more than you're disfavoring swelling by butanol, and that improves the perm selectivity. Okay. Now, up until now, I've been showing you this process separation factor. Again, those, uh, anyone in the audience who's an expert in this will recognize that that contains contributions both from the membrane and from the solution thermodynamics, things like the relative vapor pressures of butanol and water and the activity coefficients and stuff that will change the driving force for one or the other to go through the membrane. So if we want to get some information on just the membrane performance, we take this beta and we multiply by this ratio of activity coefficients and vapor pressures to get a <coughs> membrane selectivity alpha, which is the ratio of the permeabilities of butanol to water. Okay, and, and in this, only when I started digging into this did I realize how severely not ideal these uh, solutions are in a thermodynamic sense. So the activity coefficient of a 1% aqueous butanol solution, the activity coefficient of butanol is 66. So this means that there's a 66 times bigger driving force for the stuff to go through the membrane than if it was following Raoul's law. And that turns out to be in large part responsible for this reasonably large factor of beta. If you factor that out, you find that these membranes are really not butanol selective in a permeability sense. I mean, that's you know, somewhat disappointing. It's not entirely surprising. Butanol is a much bigger molecule than water. It will diffuse slower through the material. But the best we could do with these was a little bit better than 0.8, which means it's almost but not quite neutrally selective for butanol versus water transport. And the random copolymers are worse. Okay, so after getting very excited about this, we realized that you know, it's not, it's, it, there's still room for improvement. Uh, PDMS is about one on this scale. Okay? Um, so, but now that we recognize that that other unit is not inert, we decided to change it to this uh, norbornal norbornene, bigger free volume. We thought it might work well. It doesn't polymerize too well, but we can make gradient copolymers that microphase separate and random copolymers that don't. And uh, so this is work of a new postdoc. And here you can see, again, you know, as you put more of this norbornal norbornene in, the flux goes down, no surprise. And as you put more of this in, initially, uh, the separation improves, but now these numbers are pretty good. So the best block copolymer, or gradient copolymer, has a process separation factor of 41, okay? And the best random copolymer, uh, at least uh, the most selective one, is 56. It's actually better than the block copolymers, a little bit. If you take these numbers, you can translate them to alphas of 1.6 or 2.2. So these membranes now are truly butanol selective, and we've got fluxes that are comparable to or better than the commercial PDMS membrane. So either of these are better than PDMS uh, all around. And so we're excited about the potential for these. And like I said, this is still a pretty new project. So there's a lot yet to, uh, to explore, I think. So uh, I think you can read your conclusions as well as the conclusions as well as I can. But the most important conclusion is here. Bob, thanks so much for everything. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going way back in
time. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the beginnings, um, and uh, uh, we're going to start with a, a contribution from uh, Professor uh, Adel Halassa, who I got to meet uh, at Goodyear a number of times. Uh, Bob and I uh, have both uh, uh, um, uh, consulted with people in the tire industry over the years, usually on the opposite sides of uh, Akron, and we're going to start by hearing from someone who spent a lot of time uh, at Goodyear. Thank so. you very much. And uh, I am truly grateful to you for all the work that we've done together. You have been Superman. And you have helped me in my career with the industry, which is so difficult, so hard to get along with those people. But you <laughs> Which people? Actually, we started in the 17. I don't want to go back. But the one that came to my mind that the Goli program, you and I opened the door to the industry and the academia to work together and the government to support. So you were the first to do the Goli program. And I also want to, MIT has been part of my career anyway, because when I went to Kuwait, the people from MIT came in and set up a phenomenal karaoke lab for the state of Kuwait, which still exists, by the way, mm -hmm. because when they have the war, they didn't, couldn't take those equipment. They didn't, know what they, they didn't know what to use them for, but they still exist. So today I'm going to talk to you. And the reason I brought this subject because Bob used to come in, we'd have this brainstorm session, and we complete the, the, the thing was, Goodyear Tire does not meet the 100,000 mile that mission claim they have. And so Bob said to him, why don't you use different monomers? He said, alpha methylstyrene is a very unusual monomer. Why don't you guys do that? And I said, well, you cannot polymerize it anionically. He said, well, that's not my problem. That's your problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk to you about that. To tell you. So here, what we're going to do to see the thing that's more important: wear and crack and rolling resistance. These are three fundamental parts of the tire, but some of them go against each other. For example, if you have excellent wear, you don't have good traction. If you have excellent traction, you don't have good rolling resistance. So these are three fundamental things to do. So the question is: What can we use a new monomer besides styrene? that will make a solution SVR that can be used in fire industry. So for, oh, you have a uh, pointer? Okay, my, so where is dependent on the, where is dependent on the microstructure and microstructure and the long chain branching and, 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 and so that was where to, the low TG polymer, for example, like towards SVR, normal equator solution, Contribute to about 90% structure. That is the excellent, the, the wear property of that compound is excellent. Oh, um, here you go. This one's better, right here, the dough. And it's two color. You can have green or red. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the alpha metal study provides a different microstructure, and microstructure as compared to the traditional study in SPR. The metal group, that's what Bob was suggesting, that the metal group should be result in a better wear property because the, the, when, when the wear comes in, it's a radical process. And the radical, if there's a metal group on it, it's much more stable and it's very difficult to break up compared to styrene. The ability to homopolarize it as an alpha metal styrene results in no black in polymer because alpha metal styrene the ceiling temperature is 65 degrees. In other words, the thermodynamic at 65 degrees, it in charge all the way goes to monomer, not to the polymer. So, alpha metastarine thermodynamically does not homopolymerize at elevated temperature due to slow, low ceiling temperature at 65 degrees. 61 degrees Singer. Alpha methyl does not copolymerize with conjugated diene at the ceiling temperature in solution anionic polymerization if a suitable monomer is used. 
So what we have discovered by using cesium alkoxide, if you use the alkoxide of group one metal, which has to be cesium alkoxide and potassium alkoxide in combination with TMEDA, dialgyl magnesium in these different ratios, we were able to make a random alpha methylstyrene SPR, alpha methylstyrene styrene BR, alpha methylstyrene SIBR, linear polymer chain as a cheap longer, large molecular weight distribution. This gives us better traction. So we were able at that high temperature, because remember the in production, you can, uh, by the way, can, uh, you can copolymerize alpha methylstyrene at minus, minus 50 degrees, but when you talk to the chemical engineer, he said that is impossible, we are not gonna put it in front. So it has to be at high temperature. Therefore, we were able to do all of that. At a, now that gives you an idea, here what we made. We made alpha methylstyrene as far as 4060 composition. And we were able to make all of these random copolymer, look at the molecular weight distribution, and look at the branching, and so we were able to copolymerize alpha methylstyrene with styrene, make a solution SBR in production, continue isothermal process in two reactor system, in a plant, make thousands of pounds of it continuously. We're using the same catalyst system. And this way we're able to actually change the whole system. Now to give you an idea, the question would be, to give you an idea, this is the conversion versus time, and this is the, the reactivity ratio of alpha methylstyrene and styrene actually are so low that you cannot actually, even at low temperature, the reactive ratio is very sad that you cannot make a random copolymer. However, by our system, we were able to make conversion versus time to show you that the alpha methylstyrene and biodine are random. And in this way, you can see by using cesium alkoxide, TMED, diethyl magnesium at 65 degrees, target molecule 225,000 molecule. So you see, we're able to do that system. Now you can look at conversion versus total conversion, and you find that from this graph to show that it's really a true random SBR. Now, then we decided you know, it always comes in the question, cesium alkoxide, why not potassium? So we looked at potassium alkoxide, TMED, the same system. We were able to make uh, the, the alpha methylstyrene, alpha methylstyrene, buridine, solution SBR, and, and notice that the vinyl content and the molecular weight and the, the very high molecular weight, so we were able to actually randomize using styrene, but not as what the convert, the, the incorporation of the styrene was not as high as cesium alkoxide. So you can see by using this whole system, we were able, and now you notice with the potassium alkoxide, the reactive ratio actually is not, is not very, is not totally random. And so the, the, the question is, how is the alpha methylstyrene going in? Is it going in at one unit, two unit, four unit, six unit? And thanks to Bob's explanation, it's a polymerization, depolymerization. In other words, the alpha methylstyrene goes boom. Then it remembers, oh, I cannot do that. It goes right back again and zips, and on the way, grabs a buridine. The minute grab buridine, you start thinking the buridine does not work for us, so it pick up, pick up alpha methylstyrene. The alpha methylstyrene, boom, comes right back. So it's really a polymerization, depolymerization process in the same part. Like that, Frank? <laughs> That's his explanation. It works very well. <laughs> so, so we, what we, I, I mean, I don't have, you know, we, uh, Dr. Krasar can tell you, we are Purdue people can talk for hours and hours and hours of something we don't even know anything about. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see now the synthesis of alpha study. I mean, the whole system is really fabulous. And it's now, 
Um, so the polymer, you could see, we made we made all type of combination, alpha styrene, butanine. We made both alpha styrene, butanine. We made a third polymer of alpha styrene, butanine, isobreed. We made a tetrapolymer of styrene, alpha methylstyrene, butanine, because. You know, the tire industry always looking for something very novel, very new to put on that thread. Because remember, it is not the whole philosophy, uh, uh, the, old, the old commercial from Firestone at those times is when the rubber hit the road. <laughs> the key element is the thread rubber on the road is the most critical part of the tire. Even though you have all these designers and uh, uh, you know, construction engineer, all that. It's really the viscoelastic of that, ru uh, that tread rubber that controls the, the whole system again. So, so here, here's a, here's a third polymer of alpha methylstyrene and styrene and butylene, alpha methylstyrene, and could see the styrene. Now, what this hat tells us that styrene reactivity ratio is depressed. And that is what led us to make the aqua tread, which Goodyear made a fortune. They made, made a, a lot of money on that. And when Bob was, uh, was uh, consulting for me, by the way, he started in 1985, and I think went all the way to about 2002, mm -hmm. before he said. What happened, we had this aqua tread solution, and the question was, we were using 3,4 PI, and because at TG of minus 12 degrees, added to solution SBR. But they were phase separation, because Bob and I worked on phase separation way in the 70s. The question was, how can we do that phase separation? And uh, as usual, he said, well, that's your problem, not mine. You do it. <laughs> this is the guy, why don't you do it? So what we did, we actually took styrene, uridine, and isoprene, and used N-bulletin TMEDA, and we discovered at that time that the styrene, that the, the isoprene actually tapered, goes like that. But it's a TG of minus 12 degrees. And so now this, the first part of the chain is SBR. The second part of the chain is, is, is 3-4 polyisoprene, TG minus 12 degrees. <coughs> Goodyear made 200 million units in the first. The stocks of Goodyear was a $4 a share. When they developed the aqua thread, it went to $75 a share. Their debts, they paid 90% of their debt. And the reason they didn't pay all their debt was because they were afraid somebody like, like Goldsmith would come back and buy Goodyear again. So, with his help, we couldn't save Firestone 500 <laughs> because they didn't damn listen to us. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't. But you helped Goodyear, and I'm sure Goodyear management is grateful to all your assistants. You really did a phenomenal job. Thank you, Roger. I mean, you know, most of your students thought maybe you, when you went to Acne, you were just drinking beer and having a <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you one thing, folks, he didn't. <laughs> Seven o'clock, I picked him up, we had breakfast, and he left, he left uh, the Goodyear lab around six o'clock. Then he said, oh, hey, listen, give me a few minutes to work out, and took him out to dinner. Then, you know, I got, I got involved, and I invited some of his students, you know, to, uh, uh, Rick and, uh, and Frank, you know, Frank, he, he was fabulous. He comes in, and, and I had to justify his, his, his dinner, because you always have the best wine in the market. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my boss was from Israel, and you know, oh. he's from And I said, damn it, you Jordanian something. Your friends always, I said, listen, you got two choices. Either you pay the bill or I pay it. Period. No ask, no question. Either you pay it or I pay it. And he paid it. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, it's a pleasure to be with you. I have enjoyed.
Sticking with uh, the mid-1980s, um, uh, we're going to go <laughs> back uh, to uh, Mike Drazinski, uh, who graduated just as I uh, was arriving here. He's going to tell us about the things he's learned uh, from Bob in the real world. Thanks. Uh, great pleasure to be here. And again, Bob, thanks so much for being a role model for so many of us. So I put my slide together basically by going through my image files, collecting a bunch of pictures, and now I'm going to try to add some words to those pictures. So let's see how it goes. So I actually share a lot in common with Bob, and probably no one else in this room has actually been to both Oil City, Pennsylvania, and Navarre, Italy. Okay? So I, like Bob, was born in western Pennsylvania. And my grandparents lived about 10 or 20 miles from Oil City, Pennsylvania. So I actually ha was in Oil City in the 1960s when Bob was probably a famous high school senior. I did try to find a copy of the Oil City High School Yearbook, 1964. <laughs> I, have one. I couldn't find it. <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> I did find some local news clippings. Um, and so I came to, to MIT. <laughs> In 1982, right after Bob had finished a sabbatical in Italy, uh, where he worked at the uh, Instituto di Donagami, which, believe it or not, is the place where Julio Nata worked and was, again, obviously one of the co-inventors in the Zygma Nata process for making polyolefins. Mm -hmm. I went on to work for this company for eight years and spent a year actually in Italy working there as well. So, my career has been 100% uh, industrial. And so what I'm going to try to do here is to show how I've taken what I learned here, much of which came from Bob's tutorage, and how I've applied it to the real world. And as my kids would always question me why we're not rich, <laughs> and, I I have, and I was telling people at lunch, that's because I've always did it for somebody else. Um, so we start here. and. Bob, you know, after I, when I joined MIT, Frank Bates had just left, a few others before him as well, and the whole capability of the lab to do anionic polymerization was very, very well established. But unfortunate for me, all the combinations of butadiene, isoprene, and styrene you could ever think of making were already made. <laughs> and Bob, having come back fresh from his sabbatical, where they supposedly, sorry Bob, made polystyrene polypropylene block copolymers, thought it'd be interesting to make a crystalline block copolymer. So that's how I started, was to understand how crystallization would take place in, in a phase-separated block copolymer structure. And the only issue was no one knew how to make living polymerizations of polypropylene. And so much like the last speaker, Bob said, well, that's your problem, not mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. I thought that was pretty clever. Um, so this potentially could have been one of those theses where you're, you're in school forever. Because you, you have to invent something that's never done in order to make a material so you can actually start your thesis. Um, so anyway, luckily I succeeded by understanding that lithium alkyls were actually some of the first materials used before aluminum alkyls were used in the Zygma Nana process. So uh, the revolutionary day came when I, I figured out you could alkylate a transition metal like titanium and actually make a polymeric catalyst in which the ligand was the initial end group of, of your polymerization, meaning polypropylene. So I went on to polymerize polybutadiene polypropylene and um, polystyrene polypropylene. And from there, I learned a lot here at MIT about crystallization as well, about phase separation, polymer blends, and I've used that through my 30-year career in a number of ways. So, Frank told us at lunch how uh, James Way couldn't believe he left here to go work for a telephone company. <laughs> they laughed. Well, I left and I went to a company that makes Kleenex and diapers. <laughs> now, I'm not sure exactly why I went. It was in Atlanta, and as Bob would know, I've been a fan, and I still am a fan of New Jersey. I've lived there except for the three years I've lived in Atlanta. And they, were, they are the largest user of polypropylene in the world. Um, and believe it or not, they wanted to make an elastic form-fitting diaper. So prior to that, diapers had 
either a Velcro or some kind of a normal adhesive type tab. And they said, we're going to make a, a diaper or a component of the diaper out of craton. And at that time, no one had ever made an elastic fiber except for the people at DuPont through a very terrible solvent process and the product, of course, is spandex. So we actually achieved, by, by taking the learnings of MIT and phase behavior of craton-like materials and finding additives to influence certain phases over others and produced a fiber that had the right viscoelastic uh, properties and still exists today. Over billions of dollars, going back to my kids wondering why we're not rich, <laughs> over billions of dollars of these diapers uh, have been sold. Um, and believe it or not, we also led to, at that time, the invention of the adult diaper for adult incontinency. And it's still in the market, it depends. So it does show that what you learn in college can actually be useful. Um, so somehow I became a fiber expert by making fibers for diapers. I went on to work um, at Allied Signal at the time, it's today known as Honeywell. We got very involved in gel spinning polyethylene. We've heard a lot about high, high molecular weight, high densities polyethylenes. Um, but spinning these in such a way to get fully extended crystallization led to the development of, of body armor. And it was with these developments that led to the first uh, uh, wave of military action in Iraq, Desert Storm. And to this day, all of the military serving in the Middle East are protected by this, this technology. Um, I have a unique patent here because one day, I noticed a lot of the, the factory workers in Virginia where it was made commercially taking home a lot of the defective spectra fiber. And I couldn't figure out what they were doing with it. It turns out they turned it into fishing line. So we, of course, turned it into a commercial product. <laughs> um, and today it's used, for instance, to make very strong slings. It's uh, been recently used in the uh, Bay Bridge outside of Oakland to actually lift some of these large structures. So it's a material extremely stronger than steel, but at the same time, very, very flexible and forgiving. <coughs> We've touched upon, um, I think Mike Rubner mentioned this today. I also got very involved uh, with other fiber business at Honeywell. I got to crash cars because I was developing airbags. Um, we developed segmented uh, copolymers for the use in seat belts to reduce the injury that occurs uh, when they tighten uh, during an accident. But the biggest application was actually carpet fibers. And one of the challenges at the time was uh, making a blue carpet that was light stable. It had a high propensity. So we had a project called Project Blue Jay, which basically uh, involved making proper nanoparticles of titanium dioxide against a black, carbon black fiber to give us a, a Raleigh scattering kind of process to generally create an actual physical blue color. And what was so good about that carpeting was you could actually bleach it and it would always stay blue. Hmm. Um, then I moved on to a company which today is part of Ashland, which at the time was ISP, which before that was GFF, GAF, and before that was be the remnants of the German industry at uh, World War II. And I started to work with water-soluble polymers. Um, these are all vinyl amides from polyvinyl perillidone to vinyl caprolactam. And if you look at the structure, the first day I saw it, I was like, really? That's water-soluble? But it is. Um, so you start to understand why it is and what it interacts with. And all of us use this product somewhere in our daily lives almost every day. Um, it's the technology that goes into extended release Tylenol, for instance. It's what makes Heineken beer so crystal clear and gives it the proper foam stability. Um, and goes into, it's the only way you can make hollow fiber for dialysis. And so I've been very fortunate to understand how to work with the phase behavior of these types of structures to generate structures that help 
purify blood, purify beer. Um, in all of these learnings, I also learned about the hydrogen bonding characteristics, and so I was able to interact with the people at Procter & Gamble when they first uh, were interested in doing teeth whitening and made a solid complex of polyvinylperilidone and hydrogen peroxide. So it holds about 30, the solid contains 30% hydrogen peroxide, and when it sees water, it exchanges the hydrogen peroxide for the water. And so you're able to make a, a somewhat anhydrous gel put onto a simple polyethylene backing and sell these for an incredibly high price in your CVS local pharmacy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can also make hair gels with these types of materials. Perhaps the most interesting application was gas hydrates. In various parts of the world, particularly in the North Sea, there's a lot of uh, natural gas uh, mined, and it's piped along the ocean floor back to, to the UK mainland. And the uh, bottom of the ocean floor has an average annual temperature of about four degrees uh, Celsius. And it turns out that when water and natural gas components come together under high pressure, and relatively low temperatures, they form a clathrate structure in which you have an external structure, cage-like structure of, of alkanes with, with uh, trapping water molecules inside, which actually form a type of ice, which is very problematic because it plugs these eight-foot diameter pipes. And this is a picture of one of those made in the laboratory. You can actually hold the piece of ice and light it on fire and not burn your hands. <laughs> So the, the technology that has been used up until recently was 20% methanol as an antifreeze to prevent um, crystallization or solidification of these hydrates. We developed a polymer based on, on lowering its lower critical solution temperature properly that works at 0.5 um, per weight percent relative to, to the natural gas content of the pipe. So as you can imagine, it's much more environmentally friendly than the methanol and it's used in this, uh, these 40s fields. And I was fortunate or unfortunate enough to actually fly from Aberdeen, <laughs> Scotland out onto this little thing sticking in the middle of the ocean. So we heard about that boat trip to Nantucket. <laughs> well, this is no different. Luckily, the helicopter pilot knows where that is. But landing there, and more scary, is taking off from there. Um, but it was quite an adventure. So what am I doing today? Um, I'm currently getting back into the molecule making business, so to speak, although I pretty much direct people to do that. Um, over the last 10 or 12 years, we've developed some work with a synthetic form of phosphorocholine mm -hmm. um, and have created a number of monomers of that in the accolade system. And through various copolymer techniques, have made a lot of interesting biomedical materials. Again, these are materials that some of you probably use every day. So if you wear an extended wear contact lens, this technology is on that lens. It's what prevents the protein absorption, which allows you to wear them longer. Um, this is more recent work where we're doing some coating of stents. Um, so this technology, when modified, finds its way into various stents, contact lenses, and especially coatings in uh, blood filtration. Currently, we are working with some very large companies to improve uh, blood filtration and, and oxygenation that occurs when a patient is having bypass surgery. And we're also about to launch a very new uh, phosphocholine silicone hydrogel, which will should revolutionize uh, the contact lens industry. Last but not least, one of my long-range goals, and we have animal trials sc scheduled this summer, is a new type of ocular implant that's used to aid uh, glaucoma patients. So, a lot of things have changed in, since I left MIT 30 years ago. This is a, uh, an actual photograph of the, quote, portable computer that I typed my thesis on. <laughs> the screen was uh, about four by six inches. <laughs> it was uh, orange on a black background. Um, 
For those that were here in the 70s and 80s, this was the fine cuisine, <laughs> cuisine available to us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is directly across the, it was directly across from the entrance um, to the Marriott, right? There's a, there's a plaque there. There's a, there's a oh, really? plaque there. <laughs> and as I was leaving, they were just starting to demolish, we could call it construction, they were pretty much demolishing. Um, so there was, we've already heard there was a lot going on in 86. Um, unfortunately, of course, uh, that spring was the, the uh, shuttle disaster. But again, I want to personally thank uh, Bob for, for everything he's provided me in my career. But I think the most important thing I remember him from, and, and as witnessed by all the people in the room, the best advice he ever gave me was to always surround yourself with people better than you. Thanks. One thing I forgot to mention. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Almost put Exxon out of business with their RCV lead. You and Peter Kofina. <laughs> and you know what? We almost did. <laughs> but we didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Goodyear has not implemented it. If they did it on that, I must have got that, that, that minus 100 degrees TG, I mean, Colonization of ICV lead, they would have been out of business. <laughs> you and Peter Kofina did this beautiful work on permeability. I'm sorry, I have to say that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to thank all the speakers once again for, uh, for this session. Thank you so very much.